In the late 70s, while the Pink Floyds were publishing The Wall, the English teams were dominating the UEFA European Cup and turtlenecks were challenging the survival of Western civilization, the NATO countries found themselves in the position of thinking to the replacement of a plethora of different combat planes. From beyond the Iron Curtain, the MiG-29 and the Sukhoi-27 had flown in 1977 and news of their brutal performances were percolating from the intelligence agencies. In the United States, the F-15 and the F-16, two revolutionary planes for different reasons, were entering service in, during those years. In Europe, though, the situation was different. While the Tornado, a modern strike attack platform, was just entering service in the United Kingdom, Italy and Germany, while in France the Mirage 2000 was at an advanced stage, the rest of the NATO inventory was quickly becoming obsolete. In the United Kingdom, Lightning, Phantoms and Buccaneers were the backbone of the Royal Air Force. France had Mirage 3, 4, 5 and F1. The only relatively new planes in both countries were the Jaguars, but they were just attack and close air support aircraft. Italy had invested a lot on the F-104, but it was clear that the plane was quickly becoming obsolete, and the same was happening in Germany, where it was named the Widowmaker. Germany was adding the F-4 to the mix, but it was a simplified version and still it wasn't a modern plane. Both countries had a Fiat G91 for close air support and attack, but that one too was aging quickly. And pretty much the same situation was happening around Europe, where even minor countries had similar issues. Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark and Norway opted for the American F-16 in what was called at the time the contract of the century. The large European countries, though, wanted to do something different and Recognizing that everybody was in a similar situation, they began talking to each other. I am sure that you know how this story ends, but do you really know why? Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the things that we discuss here are not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. The story of the international relations that led to the modern European Delta Canards is desperately intricate. Like it happens in all these big projects, politics is, is interwoven with the military requirements and the technology problems. Actually, following all the ups and downs would be a complex exercise, but probably with little value. However, in this story lays the reason why Rafale, Typhoon and Gripen have many similarities, but also very important differences. So, I suppose we need to understand it. The first discussions started in the late 70s. The British, in the second half of the decade, were working on different concepts. They would have liked to have a multi-role platform but later they decided to split the requirement between a close air support platform and a fighter. And British aerospace in the meanwhile was toying with different prototypes, incidentally all Delta Knats. In Germany the Luftwaffe was thinking to an air superiority fighter along lines not too much different from the F-15, but was also thinking to a lot of other stuff. The French were contacted, but soon they left the talks because they were asking to be in the driver's seat for the project. The result of all these talks was a concept called ECF or later ECA. The proposal did not proceed because the German government ultimately lost interest in funding the project. However, the requisite was not going to go. The ACA program inspired the French, who were not part of the Panavia Consortium, to enter the competition starting their own program, called the ACX, Avion de Combat Experimental, which, down the line, will be the foundation of the Rafale program. At the root of the French decision, there was the resolve of preserving and maintaining the know-how necessary for a complex system like a modern multi-role combat plane. 
The ACA, however, managed to muster some preliminary funding and the British Ministry of Defence assigned a contract to build a demonstrator to British Aerospace and Air Italia. The demonstrator will become the famous EAP, which later will become the foundation for the Eurofighter. The absence of a German partner was due to the fact that the German government at the time was basically not keen to cross the French. While this dance was going on, in 1982 in Sweden, the Riksdag voted to go ahead with the Gripen program, with a very narrow majority. It was actually the result of a few years of political battles that made clear that buying a foreign plane would have depleted the foreign currency reserves and destroyed the Swedish aerospace industry. In the Swedish case, the concept was to build a multi-role platform perfectly tailored for the Swedish defense necessities. Also note that the Swedish Air Force, before settling for the Gripen, wanted two separate programs, one for an attack plane and one for a fighter. At this point, the development path of Eurofighter Typhoon, Gripen and Rafale was set. There will be many twists and turns, failed attempts of cooperation among the programs and most of all delays over delays over delays, but all the three programs managed to produce some remarkable aircraft. And indeed remarkable were the similarities among the three machines, as well as remarkable were the differences. So if you look critically at the three aircraft, you may find many similarities. The most evident one is the Delta Canard formula. They all have a Delta wing with canards or four planes. This choice was only natural since the configuration is the most aerodynamically efficient if coupled with artificial stability. If you are interested, there is a video explaining all the details. Delta wings combine excellent performances at transonic and supersonic speeds with the ability to reach very high angles of attack and remain maneuverable. Um, they also provide a series of structural and practical advantages along the way. To give its best, the delta wing needs to be coupled with canards in a neutrally stable or slightly unstable configuration. Canards help controlling the airflow above the wing, improving stability and control. All three planes have fully movable canards. Neutral stability or some instability, particularly in pitch, improves maneuverability and in general the capability of pointing the nose of the plane toward a specific direction. The demonstrators built in the 80s had among their main purposes the exploration of fly-by-wire controls and the computer algorithms that maintain the plane artificially stable. The Gripen's development was actually plagued by two incidents caused by flight computers problems, so it was no small issue. Another common element among the three aircraft is the liberal use of composite materials. Typhoon, Rafale and Gripen were the first European military combat aircraft to make use of composites for the majority of their structure, with the result of producing relatively low empty weights if compared with their size. Actually, the original EAP was nicknamed the Plastic Plane. Another interesting commonality is that all the three planes were born with a glass cockpit, making use of multifunction TV screens rather than the forest of analog instruments of the fighters of the previous era. At the time, it was clear that the pilot was overloaded with information, most of which was not needed in most of the flight conditions. So the idea was to adequate the data presentation to the flight situation, presenting on screen what was necessary to the pilot in that specific moment and nothing else. I am sure that for the youngest in the audience, thinking of an era when working on a screen was a revolutionary feature, feels like prehistory, but trust me, it happened, I've seen it. So while there was a similar technological background, there were also important differences. The root of the differences have to be found in the different specifications of the three machines. The Gripen was designed to be a cheap, 
multi-role platform tailored to the Swedish defensive requirement. The Rafale was designed since the beginning to replace a vast number of different models, so it was designed to be a multi-role platform even if this meant doing some compromises. The Eurofighter was designed since the beginning by a committee. In fact, Italy and Spain wanted an air superiority fighter, while Britain wanted a true multi-role, but developed on the basis of the EAP, which was, uh, yeah, much more a fighter than a multi-role. The Germans also wanted a multi-role, maybe, but also a cheap one, and not too multi-role because after all there was already a tornado, uh, so maybe multi-role is expensive and uh, axo. An air superiority fighter may have a low, medium or high wing, it doesn't make much of a difference, but a multi-role with a low wing is not ideal. If bulky air-to-ground loads need to be attached under the wing, it is better to have a good ground clearance. For example, this was one among the many other reasons why the F-15 could be transformed very successfully in an attack plane. If you look at the three planes from the front, you will notice that Gripen and Rafale have a medium wing, but the wing of the Typhoon is very low, suggesting that bulky underwing loads were not a particular concern at the time of design. Obviously, an appropriately sized undercarriage can guarantee the clearance anyway, but it needs to be bigger, heavier, and less suited to rough surfaces. Another difference is noticeable if we observe the planes from above. The Gripen has the four planes near the wing, a configuration that is often called close coupled because the effect on the wing is to delay the stall and stabilize the classic delta wing lifting vortices at high angles of attack. Rafale's configuration is similar even if the canals are relatively small, something that suggests that the aerodynamic center and the center of gravity do not move much in flight. On the Eurofighter, on the contrary, the four planes are mounted well ahead of the wing, with the likely purpose to increase the pitching torque that can be generated to increase the agility. Also, its wing is particularly sophisticated if compared with the other two. The aerofoil is a complex dual camber configuration that I imagine is self-stabilizing and requires little trim. It behaves like normal wing at angles of attach much higher than a classic delta, with two small strakes near the wing root generating two lifting vortices. This complexity actually seems to pay off because the Typhoon's agility it is often considered second to none by the pilots, and there are reports of the Typhoon outmaneuvering the F-22 in dogfights, despite the latter having enormous control surfaces and thrust vectoring. The difference in the specification that gave birth to the three planes is also quite clear. If we look at the air intakes, Gripen's intakes are relatively plain intakes that won't be out of place in a previous generation fighter. They may not be terribly efficient in any flight condition, but they are simple, light and cheap. Rafale's intakes have been designed with stealth in mind. They are S-shaped to hide the compressors from the impinging rudder waves. The S-shape is probably detrimental to pressure recovery, affecting the engine performance in a measure which is honestly difficult to estimate with no further data. Typhoon's box intakes are actually a much better design for supersonic flight, effectively controlling the shocks at the entrance of the conduit. The moving leap can adapt to different flight conditions, optimizing the airflow toward the end. In terms of armament, there's not much to say. The Gripen integrates a large panoply of weapons and Saab is keen to add anything that might be of value for its customers. The Rafale uses mostly French weapons or international weapons that have been developed with some French contribution. The Eurofighter today has integrated quite a large number of European and American weapons, but the air-to-ground mission has reached its maturity only in recent years. 
The electronic warfare equipment and the data integration is modern and efficient for all the three planes, with Eurofighter currently lagging behind in a few areas like the Raider, while well, mostly for political reasons rather than technological problems. From these differences, we can understand how the employment doctrine is going to be different for the three types. Obviously, the preferred course of action in a specific situation depends from the specific scenario, but still, we can identify the line of thought behind the specification. An air force other than the Swedish Air Force acquiring the Griffin is, before any other consideration, not afraid to depend from a foreign supplier that in turn, depends heavily from other NATO nations, including the United States. Force employing the Gripen will try to execute missions with a light weapons load, but with a high frequency using the quick turnaround time. Attack missions will be executed trying to sneak among the enemy defenses using the excellent electronic warfare ship. Air superiority will be achieved by trying to attack the enemy forces at long range and from unexpected directions, again leveraging the electronic warning ship. In the absence of long-range weapons like the Meteor, the plane will still be an excellent defensive fighter, but it might have difficulties in establishing a permanent air superiority against the modern fighters. Its kinematic performances penalize some of the weapons. An Air Force acquiring the Rafale is also making the choice of depending from the French defense industry if it doesn't want to incur in costly weapon integration. A force equipped with the Rafale may use the plane in a more direct and bold manner. It will use the long legs of the plane and the Spectra electronic warfare suite to penetrate the enemy airspace and attack high value targets. In the air-to-air -air mission, the Rafale is perfectly capable of establishing the air superiority by flying combat air patrols in contested areas, particularly with the Meteor missile. The excellent supercruise capability gives energy and range to the weapons, and the data integration is a further force multiplier. An Air Force acquiring the Eurofighter should be focused on the air superiority mission with less pressing necessities for the air-to-ground missions. Because of its design, the Typhoon can fly high-altitude caps at high supersonic speed in supercruising, imparting a very high energy to the weapons at long and medium range, yet retaining the capability of engaging the enemy planes in dogfights and prevail. It would give its best in conjunction with force multipliers like OWAX uh, to acquire the control of large portion of the airspace, removing the opposition to other types of mission. It would be, if you forgive the analogy, a use similar to the F-22, but without the stealth. The air-to-ground mission would be a secondary mission for the plane, even if the more recent versions are quite capable in this area. So we made a lot of comparisons, highlighting similarities and differences. And the natural question now is, which one is the best? My answer is, it makes absolutely no sense in the case of combat planes thinking in terms of an absolute ranking. It might be satisfactory, but it is an oversimplified and almost childish approach, to be honest. In a specific condition, within a specific scenario, a mission may be successful or not. And this is the only thing that matters. So, if you find this video interesting, you, I'm sure you will find interesting also the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And please, if you can, consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon. That would be amazing. In the meanwhile, Thank you very, very much for watching and goodbye.